Hi everyone, this is a recording of my first lecture for the uh, BTY 719 Biofuels course. Um, this, co this part of the course is basically just an introduction. Uh, what we want to focus on in these first lectures are uh, the nomenclature that we're going to use, the classification of biofuels, the motivation of why we need biofuels and so on. So let's start off by just defining biofuels. Biofuels uh, are basically defined as a solid, liquid or gaseous fuel that is obtained from lifeless or living biological materials. So it is essentially a biofuel if it is made from a biological feedstock. So it's uh, that's a type of fuel whose energy is derived from biological carbon fixation. And uh, we might ask, why do we need them? So this all comes back basically to uh, the fact that we require energy for everything that we do. So in addition to uh, industrial energy needs, people need electricity, they need transport. Uh, this little pie chart is taken from uh, data that was uh, produced in the USA. Um, and we basically see that through all of these things that we need uh, in our daily lives, we use quite a lot of energy. So this energy uh, obviously comes from different sources um, and maybe we don't use quite as much for heating our buildings in, in South Africa. But the point is that every uh, thriving economy, every growing economy needs energy. And if you're a growing economy, you're going to need more of it as time goes on. So where does our energy currently come from? Um, currently, most of our energy is derived from coal, oil and gas. All of these are, of course, fossil fuel resources. We look at this graph that I took from uh, a report that was published last year. We'll see that oil production has grown in uh, the time since, since 1993 to 2018, but it hasn't grown by that much. And that is because uh, oil is becoming more and more of a limiting resource. Uh, it becomes more difficult to produce more oil as uh, the places where you have to go to get oil um, is uh, is more difficult and more dangerous and more expensive to actually mine such as under the sea um, there's similarly been an increase in the use of natural gas natural gas is a byproduct of oil production in many cases uh, in 30 or 40 years ago a lot of that was just simply burned off but now the natural gas is captured that is methane that comes out of the ground it is captured and it is also used and burned as a as a fossil fuel. Now, just because it says natural doesn't mean that it is a, a biofuel. This is methane um, that is, is, as I said, part of, uh, of oil production. And we get, uh, when we burn that, it is also a fossil fuel that is being used. Um, coal production has actually grown a lot in the last uh, 25, 30 years. And uh, there's still a lot of coal in the world. Um, it's a relatively dirty process to get it out of the ground. It produces a lot of, uh, of, of gases that is put into the air when it is burned. But it is a reliable form of energy. And as especially countries like India and China have grown uh, their economies, they have commissioned a lot of, of uh, coal-fired uh, electricity plants. And so that is why we see this big increase in the, in the usage of coal. Um, nuclear power hasn't really grown much. Um, the world's kind of lost it, its taste for nuclear energy um, with some, some notable uh, disasters. Even though nuclear energy is actually still uh, a good source of, of highly concentrated uh, energy that can be provided safely if it's done correctly. Um, other things like hydroelectricity is, is a good part of the fuel mix. That is the only really... Uh, renewable that we see here um, that uh, makes a big part of the energy mix. Other renewables include wind, solar and um, and biofuels and you'll see that has significantly grown but it's still making up a very small percentage of the overall energy mix. So most of our fuel, uh, most of the energy that we get uh, is still from some kind of fossil fuels, natural gas, uh, coal, uh, petroleum that is being burnt, um, that actually provides most of our, uh, most of our energy with our um, renewables making a very small part in that. So this has led to some major challenges, this using of, of, of uh, fossil fuels. 
The first is increased uh, level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which leads directly to climate change. Um, fossil fuels are, of course, also a finite resource. There's only so much of it, and it is not uh, distributed evenly geographically, which makes it difficult for some countries to be secure in their energy sources. And uh, the price is, is not fixed, and so um, it is sometimes very expensive, and energy is required for all kinds of community development and eco economic growth. And some communities in some countries can't actually uh, afford the price of fossil fuels. So um, with all of this said, we are heading for a non-sustainable future uh, in this kind of business as usual approach by just burning more and more fossil fuels for our needs. Um, the current fossil fuel energy paradigm is therefore not quite sustainable. This is taken from uh, data from the World Wildlife Fund uh, in a report published in 2012. So business as usual approach uh, to our energy future will mean uh, substantially higher and more volatile energy costs. Um, this is driven by an increasing scarcity of fossil fuels uh, from more physically and politically challenging areas, as I've mentioned. So uh, at the, the time in 2012, it was estimated that about 1.4 billion people have no access to reliable electricity. Uh, and 2.7 billion depend on traditional fuels such as wood and charcoal and manure for cooking and heating. And these are often harvested in ways that are highly damaging to the environment and used in ways that can be damaging to both the environment and to health. So fossil fuel use is, not, uh, is actually the most serious single contributor to climate change. It causes about two thirds of all greenhouse gas emissions. So uh, the International Energy Agency uh, Energy Technology Perspectives in uh, 2012 projected that um, certain things will happen by the year 2050 and 2100 and beyond that um, if we either just have a business as usual approach to our energy mix or if we make certain changes and certain restrictions. They estimate about an increase in 6 degrees Celsius in the mean global temperature in a completely business as usual approach where it means we, we're just burning more and more fossil fuels. They predict about an increase of about four degrees Celsius, uh, which assumes adoption of a range of policies um, that are currently under consideration worldwide. And 2% um, increase in, in, in mean global temperature is basically the least that can be imagined um, if we have very strict policies in place and everybody sticks to them. So these policies are basically to avoid shift and accelerate, avoid energy use where uh, necessary, thereby decreasing our demand for, uh, or also to uh, increase um, efficiency of, uh, of, of um, the ways in which we use energy at the moment. Shift away from higher emissions to lower emission modes, um, use more public transport, more rail transport, instead of everybody having their own car, uh, for instance. And then accelerate development of uh, advanced low carbon technologies um, of which biofuels will be one. So fully sustainable and renewable energy supplies uh, are the only way we can secure energy for everyone and avoid an environmental catastrophe. So why use biofuels? Um, it'll help us to address a lot of these environmental concerns. Um, our fossil energy resources are in decline or more difficult to retrieve and um, we can become less reliant on energy imports. Most countries, including South Africa, have to import uh, a lot of oil um, for our needs and if we can use more biofuels, it means we need to import less um, and that is as very favorable uh, economic outcomes. Um, we also need alternative energy sources. Biofuels are one possibility as a replacement for fossil fuels. Um, it is not a, a scenario of biofuels versus wind energy versus solar energy. We need all of these alternatives um, to, to produce uh, sources of uh, sustainable, uh, renewable and reliable energy. So although biofuels still cost more than fossil fuels, uh, which is its biggest drawback, their share in terms of uh, use is increasing worldwide, as you saw on that graph earlier with the, the renewables um, growing significantly over the last 25 years. 
So uh, we will have a look at some advantages and disadvantages of biofuels. Uh, we have to acknowledge that there are disadvantages as well, and this will help us to plan um, the implementation and the use of biofuels in a way that is um, that is more advantageous or that limits the, um, the, the possible damages. First, though, the advantages of biofuels. Biofuels lessen the burden on our gradually de depleting fossil fuels. Um, they are comparatively environmentally friendly. Um, they help reduce carbon emissions uh, into the atmosphere as they are considered to be almost carbon neutral. Um, so the carbon that is fixated into plants are used to produce a fuel which is then burned by cars, uh, putting that carbon dioxide back in the air. It's not 100% um, closed carbon cycle, but at least there's far less uh, emissions than with fossil fuels. Uh, fossil fuels are created, of course, over millions of years, and this was done millions of years ago, while biofuels can be made very quickly, um, so biofuels are therefore considered to be renewable. Um, at least renewable in the time frame that we wish to use them. Biofuels can be used as uh, transport fuels as well with existing infrastructure. That this means if we can make ethanol or butanol, we can mix it with existing fuels and we can supply it to uh, users using uh, petrol stations and so on, the, the existing infrastructure. Um, it can also be used in part for electricity and heat generation, uh, which is another big advantage. And it, of course, as I said, reduces our dependency on fossil fuel imports for making all of our fuels for vehicles. And this is improved energy security. As I said, there are definitely disadvantages to biofuels as well. Um, first and foremost is the production cost. It's not currently competitive uh, with fossil fuels. Um, there is the acknowledged food versus fuel debate, uh, which means if you're diverting farm land or crops that are produced on farms into producing biofuels instead of producing food, um, that can be detrimental to the global food supply and to food prices. However, this debate is generally blown out of proportion um, as there are uh, lots of uh, places in the world where a uh, huge uh, amount of surplus uh, food is produced that can actually be used in, in uh, producing fuel without having any impact on uh, food supply at all. Even in South Africa, we have a lot of fallow farmland. Um, we're not using this farmland optimally. We can theoretically produce a lot more um, maize, for example, and, and use um, have more than enough to feed everybody in the country and produce fuel as well. Um, not enough to replace all of our petrol, um, but certainly enough um, so that we can have a, a biofuel in the mix and without actually um, hindering the food supply. Um, but we do acknowledge that there is definitely this food versus fuel debate and this is something that has to be planned properly. There are, as with everything, good and bad ways of uh, producing and using biofuels. There are some emissions of hazardous gases. It depends on the way that the biofuel is produced and it depends on um, what we, uh, what, which biofuels we're actually talking about. But uh, nitrous ox uh, oxide emissions uh, may occur due to crops with higher requirements for nitrogen fertilizers. There's a burning of some biodiesels uh, that may emit aldehydes. Um, there's what we call indirect land use changes um, this is if you are using a, um, a field that was used to produce a, one type of crop and that type of crop now has to be grown elsewhere. Pristine land is cleared. Um, that's an indirect land change um, impact of your production of biofuels. Um, so using pristine land leads to soil erosion, uh, leads to deforestation, leads to decreased biodiversity. Um, such as the well-publicized um, problems with uh, producing palm oil that is also used as a, as a biofuels feedstock um, in places like um, Indonesia and Malaysia. So um, when you're using pristine land, you're decreasing biodiversity, you're also releasing more carbon dioxide uh, when you clear this land, uh, which translates into a net increase in carbon dioxide emissions. And that's actually the thing you want to stop with biofuels. 
So any new crop that you need to grow, of course, um, you also have an impact on your available water resources. So you will have uh, for your crop irrigation and for your use in biorefineries, you need quite a lot of water as well. So um, what is this biomass? Um, the feedstock of our biofuels. Biomass is an organic matter derived from living or recently living organisms. Mostly we will talk about lignocellulosic biomass, in other words, plant biomass um, during this course, but um, it can be some other feedstocks um, that are from biological material as well. Um, they're of course not only used for biofuels, they have uh, uses in, 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 uh, in energy. Um, so they're used for heat production, they're used for electricity um, when co-firing with coal. Uh, and you can use this biomass um, as liquid fuels for transportation, as we'll see. But there are, of course, non-energy uses as well um, to biomass, such as food production for humans and animals, uh, wood for construction materials, clothing uh, from cotton and, and wool and leather, etc., uh, paper production, packaging production, and so on. But biomass is the only major renewable source um, that is available for sustainable production of uh, liquid and gaseous fuels. So how do we use this biomass? Can we use it directly as a fuel? Well, of course, we can uh, burn uh, wood and get some heat and energy from it. Um, but how does that actually uh, slot into the way that we use energies in cars, uh, for, as well, uh, for example? So, uh, biomass is very different from the conventional fuels in its raw form. Um, it is generally, of course, a solid, whereas our conventional fuels are liquids or gases. Uh, it has a relatively lower energy density, a lignin cellulosic biomass, um, in terms of, for example, petrol, where you see is, is at least uh, more than two times higher energy density. Um, it has a high moisture content con compared to conventional fuels, which has no moisture in it. It um, has a high oxygen content in comparison. So uh, we can also look at this at the, the molecules, the fats, the proteins, and the carbohydrates that are uh, available in, in cellulose and hemicellulose in our lignin cellulosic biomass, as well as this polymer called lignin. Um, it looks very different on a molecular level from what your conventional fuels will look like. And so... Um, when it comes to compatibility, compatibility, biomass directly is not compatible with our existing engines, uh, boilers or turbines. Um, and so biomass must be converted to a type of fuel that can be used with our uh, existing infrastructure um, of, of engines, boilers, turbines, etc. So how do we convert biomass to a biofuel of choice? Um, we have uh, lots of conversion technologies. They are generally classified as either a biological conversion technology or a thermochemical conversion technology. So biological means that the conversion technology itself uses a microbe um, to convert the biomass to a fuel. The advantage with that is that it makes a chemical with a high specificity um, it works in aqueous media and is reasonable uh, temperatures and, and pressures that are involved, um, which keeps costs from that point of view down. Um, its disadvantages, though, is that it requires a specific chemical input. So, for example, for a microbe to ferment something, it requires uh, often a monomeric sugar that you need to produce before that fermentation can happen. It also has relatively low throughput, um, so it, 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 you don't, don't produce that much biofuel in a short amount of time. Um, examples of fuels that can be produced in this way is ethanol that we'll spend quite a lot of time on, as well as methane, uh, butanol, and biodiesel. Thermochemical methods suggest that we use traditional uh, thermal and chemical processing, and we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. This doesn't require a lot of chemical specificity in feedstocks, which is a big advantage. You can use any type of lignocellulosic biomass in any kind of mixture, and you can, depending on the thermochemical process, still make a lot of your, uh, of your biofuel. Uh, it can also be uh, relatively high throughput in comparison to the biological route, but you do require very extreme pressures and temperatures, as we shall see. Um, when you use uh, lignocellulosic biomass, you also have a disadvantage here that you get catalytic fouling, 
uh, and inorganic, inorganic precipitation, which is unwanted and, and, and can ruin some pretty expensive equipment. Um, and there's also a lack of chemical specificity in the chirality um, of the product that you do make. But you can produce uh, syngas through this process, as well as methane, diesel, petrol, um, ethanol, and uh, hydrogen. So there's quite a lot of scope for, 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 for some very uh, required products there. So a little bit more detail on uh, biomass conversion using microorganisms. Uh, the feedstocks that you can use is mainly sugar, uh, could be glycerol, um, could also be in, in some cases with very specific organisms, syngas or fatty acids. And then through the cellular metabolism, which is the biochemical reaction specific to the feedstock and specific to uh, the type of organism and the type of product required, you can make a fermented product. And so we'll see that um, the fuels that are produced in this way can be ethanol or butanol, in some cases biodiesel, uh, or even hydrocarbons, uh, hydrogen, etc., depending on uh, the feedstock used and uh, which organism uh, you use. For uh, thermochemical options, though, uh, as we mentioned, we can simply burn biomass uh, for electricity or for heat. Um, but coal is much cheaper, uh, much higher concentrated, uh, much less water in there. Um, so you get more energy per unit. Uh, you can co-fire uh, biomass with coal, and that's often used to, to remove waste wood material. There are um, better thermochemical technologies available, though, for lignin cellulose. The first is pyrolysis, which is heating of biomass for a short period of time under vacuum uh, to about 500 degrees Celsius in the absence of oxygen. So this will result in the formation of biogas, a bio oil, and uh, that comes from condensation of vapors during rapid cooling and a solid called char. When we look at pyrolysis, it creates about 75 Five percent of the liquid, that's this crude bio-oil, 13% uh, gas and 12% char. Compare that with uh, full gasification. Uh, this happens at much higher temperatures for longer times uh, in the presence of oxygen and it yields uh, syngas for fissure tropes synthesis of fuels. And this gasification um, yields about 5% uh, liquid, it's mostly gas, 85% gas, and about 10% of the solid, which is the char. So there's been uh, a lot of work that we're not going to go into too much detail in on the optimization of different types of pyrolysis, so-called fast, slow, and vacuum pyrolysis, uh, using different feedstocks, such as sugar cane bagasse, corn stover, eucalyptus. Um, and this has been for the production of charcoal, for the production of activated uh, carbon, for biochar and uh, bio oil. So this biochar um, has been used quite successfully in fertilizers. It's quite useful. Uh, and the bio oil has been used as well. Um, but because this has a varied chemical composition, a lot of different types of, of oil molecules in there, um, you require significant upgrading of this oil in order for it to be used in conventional engines. And that makes the pyrolysis process uh, less attractive because this upgrading process is quite expensive. For the, um, the gasification technology, um, as we said, uh, the goal here is to, is to produce syngas and then use that syngas to produce a, a, a conventional fuel. So biomass with steam or oxygen is put into a gasifier and this is, as we said, very high temperature, 800 degrees Celsius. Under those conditions, we get production of a syngas, which is carbon monoxide uh, and hydrogen. And then Fischer-Tropsch process can be used, again, high temperatures are used uh, to produce a fuel of interest. So this um, can be practiced on, on small scale using biomass, um, but it is much cheaper to do it in large scale and to do it with coal. Um, Co-gasification of biomass with coal has been done at Sassel. They've uh, investigated this uh, process but they get differences in reactivity between biomass and coal and that affects the overall process. And then because of that catalytic fouling that I mentioned earlier, um, Sassel actually prefers not to do this process. Um, but theoretically this can be done and syngas can then be converted into liquid fuel uh, such as diesel and alcohols uh, through the Fischer-Tropsch processes. 
So uh, coal to liquids and gas to liquids technology is of course in commercial use, but as I said, this uses um, coal. Um, Sassel is very successful of this and using this, they make a large uh, component of our uh, petrol uh, and diesel uh, that we use in the country. I think about 40% of our overall usage, but um, they are, as far as I know, not interested in using um, biomass in, in co-gasification anymore because of the associated problems that I've mentioned. So then um, to end off this, this first part of the lecture, um, we can then define uh, the most commonly used uh, biofuels at the moment. Um, these then are bioethanol, of which uh, about 144 billion litres were produced in 2018, um, about half of which was produced in the USA alone, um, mostly through um, using the what they call corn ethanol fermentation process, so uh, ethanol that is produced from maize. Um, then about uh, 36 billion litres uh, biodiesel was produced in 2018, about a half of that in, in the European Union, where biodiesel is the biofuel of choice. Um, a significant amount of biogas has also been produced, and this is something that's been uh, increasing to a large degree um, all over the world. So we will discuss these different types of uh, biofuels in more detail in uh, the second part of this lecture.